Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Bishop Brian Ouellette of the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church for Vestiges of Christianity on this July 7th, 2018. Brand new episode here. And uh, today we're going to be taking some of the questions from uh, Twitter over the last week and elaborating on them, uh, specifically the four types of demons and the nature of purgatory. These are topics we have discussed on the show in the past, but um, I know specifically the episode on the four types of demons had technical issues, and I've always wanted to revisit this topic again to produce a better uh, more complete uh, and trouble-free uh, version of the content, and today we are going to tackle that uh, since the subject seems to be coming up a lot on Twitter. I'm also here with my new co-host, Joy Keeling, and uh, we will be back here in just a moment. Don't go away. Once again, welcome everyone to a new edition of Vestiges of Christianity. I am Bishop Brian Willette, coming to you live from the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains here on this July 7th, 2018. And uh, I want to uh, mention, uh, just before we get started here on today's topics, a few things that I really want to mention uh, or I feel are important that we discuss uh, moving forward uh, with, you know, all of the visibility on social media as well as some of the communication that happens behind the scenes with my office and, and the public. And I want to set some expectations. I want you to hear it from my own mouth, uh, what those expectations are in terms of how uh, to get help from this ministry because this ministry is ultimately here to serve you. And the Order of Exorcists, as well as, you know, uh, the outreach ministry through the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church is completely free of charge. We do not charge for investigations. We do not charge to help people. Um, but what is very important that you understand about that is that this ministry does not have a product that it sells. It does not have a service that it charges for. And so everything that it does is donation-based. And most of the people that come to us for help are in such bad shape uh, spiritually, which affects them, of course, psychologically and mentally. They are not able, usually, to sustain a job of significance in order to help to support the ministry that is helping them, like it would happen in a normal church sy system. We also operate a mission church, so we don't have a normal congregation. Um, we don't have a uh, regular attendance at Mass uh, because of the nature of how a mission church operates, which is very different from a traditional Catholic parish. So we're not getting resources from that either. And what this means is the, the monies that we do have coming in, which are completely donation-based, uh, are only enough, are only sufficient for us to be able to serve. In fact, they're not even sufficient they're sufficient enough 
to serve the Atlanta, Georgia jurisdiction in which we find ourselves, which is about a two-hour radius around Metro Atlanta. Um, but there are numerous people that contact me and my office from outside of the Atlanta Georgia area, people from other states, even people from other countries, even as far away as Saudi Arabia uh, and India. I have had uh, requests from help from everywhere. Uh, and what needs to be understood is while we are more than happy to help those individuals, you have to either be willing to come to me and fly to my office, or if your particular issue requires a house visit, which a lot of these types of cases do because of the nature of demonic infestation, as well as the need for house blessings and the various other things that we can do in order to help uh, a person that's going through a spiritual crisis uh, of this kind. Um, we are in a situation where the ministry cannot afford to pay to mobilize my team to another state or another country. Um, without the client who's seeking the help paying for it. So you're not paying for the services. You're not paying for the investigation. You're not paying for the resolution. And you're certainly not paying for the sacraments that we use to help you. But you are having to pay for the out-of-pocket expenses involved in coming out to you, which includes airfare, food, lodging, transportation, and incidentals. And that can get very expensive very quickly. So we do ask for uh, a $5,000 retainer for most cases, uh, in which case we use as much, uh, uh, or as little, I should say, of that as possible, and whatever is left over minus $1,000 for shutting, off, shutting down the church for a week, because usually these out-of-state uh, cases take about a week to resolve, or we need to allow for at least a week. Sometimes we can handle things in less time than that, but we always kind of shoot for a week estimate. Um, and as well as paying for people's loss income, because my team works on a volunteer basis, and a lot of them have secular jobs that they have to leave in order to come on these investigations. They don't get paid for that time away from their work, and I have to compensate them for that. Um, so whatever we don't use from the retainer is returned to the client. But I want to make clear that um, a lot of people contact us expecting that you know it's not going to cost them anything. Because they see that, you know, investigations are free. Well, they are free, but the travel is not. The airlines don't let us travel for free. Uh, the uh, hotels don't let us stay there for free. Um, you know, restaurants don't let us eat while we're traveling for free. It's, it, it's just the way the world works. And those monies have to come from somewhere, and the ministry just doesn't have it. So I can guarantee you this ministry probably makes less money than you do. Uh, and if, uh, if you can't afford to uh, pay for those incidentals, how do you expect the ministry to do so? You know, we're not financed by the Roman Catholic Church. We're not financed by a larger organization that's bringing in money from some other avenue. It's strictly donations from the people's kindness and generosity and charity out there in the world. And it's not sufficient. So I want to set that expectation. By all means, contact us if you need help. But understand where the, you know, what that entails. You are asking uh, five to seven people to travel out to you, usually, you know, on a, in a distance that requires air travel. Um, and to be able to uh, live and exist for a week in a new location this ministry does not have the money for that, at least not at this time. Now, there is a solution to this, and that is hopefully um, my treatment for a reality show will be picked up by a network. And we've already shot a pilot. We've already created a teaser reel with a great, big, very professional, very well-known producer. And if that show is one day picked up, then we'll have a travel budget, in which case you know, we can take some of the uh, most urgent cases and go out and help people completely free of charge because the the show will be able to pay for that and that's one of the primary reasons i created the show was so that we could reach more people um if this is something that you would like to watch on television or if you are would like to help us to be able to uh, gain you know resources through that budget um then please let the networks know that you want this show call them write them let them know all right enough of that 
Just wanted to set that expectation because it happens a lot, and I can't always explain that on Twitter uh, in a way that is uh, going to be, uh, you know, as as complete as it needs to be. So, uh, Joy, welcome uh, back to your second uh, appearance on this show. I really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And so I know that, you know, last week we talked about looking through Twitter and and seeing what kinds of questions people are asking that deserve a a more complete answer. And I know that you've been paying attention to that. So um, what's one of the uh, tweets that you saw that we can perhaps answer today? Well, one of the, uh, actually one of the first ones was uh, asking for the next podcast, I would like to hear your explanation of purgatory and limbo. Yeah, limbo and, and purgatory, these are some interesting theological concepts, or I should say theological extrapolations that are based upon certain things that are indicated within both the Bible and the apostolic tradition uh, from which the Bible was written and uh, the fathers of the church that were well versed in this uh, in both the theology of the Bible and apostolic tradition and so one of the things that uh, is indicated and part of it is because of certain things that are in the apocrypha that uh, you know Protestants and, and don't necessarily see as inspired but even outside of that and I don't want to get into you know, the justification for the existence of this theology. I just want to talk about what it is, because from a first-hand vantage point, people that are working in paranormal investigation and working with the dead on a regular basis, I mean, that essentially is my job as an exorcist, um, and as well as uh, as a person that helps to heal not just the living, but the dead, and that's part of our obligation as Christians, to pray for the dead on a regular basis. It's part of every Mass. Um, it comes from this idea that there is uh, a um, a middle condition, okay? And I want to use the word condition for all of these potential afterlife states because we tend to think in terms of space and time. We're very linear creatures, and we want to be able to look out there into the afterlife and say that, you know, heaven is a place that you go to. Hell is a place that you end up. And they're not places, not by any stretch of the imagination. They are conditions, and they are conditions that don't necessarily require death in order to experience them. Believe me, there are many people that are living in a hell of their own creation, as well as people that are so well connected to the divine that every day is a blessing, which is very much like what one would expect from the kingdom of heaven. Of course, they're still living within an entropic universe. They're still subject to suffering, need, and death. And so it's not perfect. It's not a perfect expression of what our expectation for heaven is. But understand that it is a condition that can be cultivated now. And it's not a place you go to. It's a realization that you achieve. And that goes for heaven and hell. All right, but there is always going to be theologically extrapolations as to what that means, and so a lot of Protestants like to look at it and say it's very black and white. You know, if you've lived a virtuous life, if you've taken Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you truly believe that, then uh, you know you're going to go to heaven. But if you don't believe that, or if you haven't, you know, uh, been a good person, depending upon which type of denomination of Christianity you're talking to, because there are some out there that teach that all you need is faith in Jesus, and um, no matter how bad a person you are, uh, it doesn't have any effect on your salvation, which I strongly disagree with, but outside of that, and I don't want to get into, you know, again, a theological debate over some of the justifications here, I just want to talk about the the condition of purgatory to answer this uh, individual's question. Um, It's important that we understand Um, that a person who dies, okay, is not, is not automatically subject to judgment in this theological sense, and then it's decided whether or not they were virtuous virtuous enough, they go to heaven, if they weren't, they go to hell. Okay, that's not at all what the nature of the afterlife is. The afterlife is even a misnomer because there really is no life after life unless you have attained to eternal life, in which case it's just a 
perpetuation of your the current life that you have. It's not this other thing that happens to you, um, because the natural state now, okay, getting back to a little bit about what we talked about last week and talking a great deal about <coughs> what you know, we're referring to uh, today, is that when you die, because of the fall of man, or what the Bible, again, getting into the theology, refers to as you know this, the original sin of Adam and Eve, that the consequence of that brought death into the world. Now that's a metaphor uh, for an ineffable event that happened on some spiritual level that we cannot wrap our human brains around. We just can't do it. This is the best that we can come up with to explain what occurred, uh, but it's not history, okay? Adam and Eve are not historical figures in that sense. Did they exist? Yes, but not in in a sense that there were these two naked people living in some garden somewhere and, you know, life was perfect until they screwed everything up. That's a metaphor. That aspect of it is pure metaphor. We have to understand that. We have to accept that before we can really fully embrace the rest of the answer to this question. So understanding that original sin is the, what brought death into the world, it's not natural to our condition. It wasn't what we were created to be. We were created to be eternal by our, na- by our very nature because we shared in the divine reality of God, which is eternal. Um, that changed the dynamic of how the cosmos work. That changed <coughs> creation as it exists. And so now we have to deal with that. So what does that mean? That means that now all things being equal, as long as nothing has changed, okay, assuming you do no work, assuming you make you cultivate no spirituality, assuming that you have no relationship with God whatsoever, then your natural state is to grow old and die. And both your corporeal and non-corporeal forms go with it. So your corporeal form is your body. We already know that that rots away and dies. And your non-corporeal form, which what you experience as a human being to be your mind, your thoughts and your feelings, things that kind of resemble brain activity but are far more beyond that. We're talking about the essential cultivation of awareness itself that are intrinsic to an intelligent being like a human. Um, that non-corporeal aspect, which is what we refer to as a spirit, dies too. Okay? It just dies at a different rate than the body. The body is a little bit more <coughs> fragile and so it, it more quickly dissipates um, and enters into, you know, rigor mortis and then uh, decay. But the spirit also starts to enter into a state of decay immediately upon death. Once it no longer has the body to nourish it, it starts to break down. In its natural state, assuming nothing has been changed within that particular condition, will eventually dissipate into nothingness. And this was referred to in the ancient Jewish world as Sheol, and that translates to hell. Same thing with the pagan world. Uh, they refer to it as Hades, and that also translates to the word hell. It was only in the Middle Ages, or perhaps a little bit before then, when the idea of hell was converted into this place of eternal punishment, where you are there sent to be tortured by Satan and his demons. This is a very erroneous perception that would have been completely foreign to Jesus and the apostles. Um, that's not what they taught. Okay, They taught that uh, hell is this state of basically annihilation, which is why Jesus referred to it in the metaphor of the fires of Gehenna, which was a trash dump that existed outside of the walls of Jerusalem where they burnt their trash to get rid of it. Same thing with uh, the execution of criminals. They were executed. Uh, once they were executed, they weren't worthy of a proper burial, so they were basically cremated out there with the rest of the trash uh, to get rid of them. Okay, It was annihilation. It wasn't a place to be punished. It was a place to just get rid of junk. And so in the theology of the church, whether it sounds nice or not, it's just true, Christian theology considers the unsaved to be basically cosmic junk that just needs to be get, getting rid of. And so Jesus has the parable of the weeds and the wheat to kind of explain this to us. Um, and why, you know, there, why it also explains why evil isn't completely uh, uh, washed away just yet. Even though evil has been defeated by the cross, it also explains why we are still uh, having to deal with it. Because um, 
you know, as a metaphor goes, that if you were to harvest it all right now, you would take up the good wheat. Uh, if you try to get rid of the, the weeds, you could end up damaging the wheat. So wait until they're ready to be harvested, harvest it all, and then separate it. Put the weeds into one pile and burn them. Put the wheat uh, into uh, a storage unit to be saved, literally saved, which is the basis for the idea of salvation, where it's preserved because there there's usefulness to them. So that helps to be, be form the basis or the foundation for understanding where purgatory comes <coughs> from, because purgatory is an in-between state between those those conditions, the exception being that purgatory is not a state to attain to salvation. So this is where a lot of Protestants misunderstand what Catholic theology is saying regarding purgatory because they think it's like a second chance after you're dead. No, it's not a second chance. You don't end up in purgatory uh, as an opportunity to to gain salvation, and if you don't achieve it there, you end up in hell. That's not how it works. Everybody that goes to purgatory is already saved. Purgatory is not to be saved. Purgatory is to be made pure enough to enter into the perfection of the kingdom of heaven because heaven is so perfect, it, there is nothing imperfect that can enter into it. But as long as a person has attained to enough grace while they were alive uh, to warrant salvation, any of their remaining imperfections are, are rectified in this secondary condition that the church calls purgatory. That's referred to kind of as a cleansing fire. There's again more uh, metaphorical language that's injected into it that sort of kind of paints an erroneous picture of what purgatory is. Some have even seen it as a place of suffering. Um, but it isn't really suffering in any uh, definitive sense. It is essentially uh, just the longing for the beatific vision of being in the presence of God, knowing now, having more of a concrete understanding of what God is, and then being deprived of it because you're just not quite perfect yet, and you're being made perfect. You're being made ready to enter into the perfection of the kingdom of heaven, which you could say in scientific terms is ectropy, which is eternity. It's a sense of, 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 of going from increasing states of, of disorder into increasing states of order, which is the opposite of the entropic type of universe that we live in. So uh, that's essentially what purgatory is. A person who has cultivated enough grace who dies in a state of grace, but yet is not quite yet perfect to enter into the kingdom, is put into this condition of purgatory to be made perfect so that they can enter into the kingdom. And everyone who enters into the, the, the state of purgatory will make it to heaven. That's a definitive, absolute condition. Okay, It is not a place of salvation. You've already been saved. It's just now you're being made uh, perfect. Okay, It's different. But, so what's limbo then? Well, limbo, you could say, is the a state of when a soul is, in, or I should say not a soul, a spirit is in the state of dissipation. Okay, well, as it is being broken down by the faculties of death, subject to the same entropic realities of the physical world, um, that state of being broken down is basically limbo, and when it is completely lost, it's hell, just as the ancients would have seen it with their translations of Sheol and Hades being perfect, uh, perfectly correlated to hell. Not a place of punishment, although the punishment ultimately is that uh, because you failed to cultivate grace while you were alive, now you, this is your result. This is all you've got left is to die. Um, but it's not, it's not torture. I mean, other than the fact that now you know that you could have had God and you chose not to because you were too lazy or too disbelieving or just didn't want to work for that relationship, whatever the case is, there's lots of reasons that people could end up in a condition of hell, but that's what it is. So think of it to get into some kind of way of explaining this. Think of it as you have um, limbo as the entrance into hell, which is essentially annihilation. So hell is just complete, uh, complete, complete annihilation. And then limbo is the state of entering into that uh, state of annihilation. Whereas hell, I mean, heaven is perfection and eternity, eternal life, forever existing in the presence and love of God, where there is perfect love, perfect happiness, perfect everything. Uh, and purgatory is the entrance to that reality. Okay. 
And uh, the choice is yours. Depends on how much grace you wish to cultivate. So that's what it is. So when we are talking about what are these ghosts that we are communicating with in paranormal investigation, when you see Zach Bagans on on Ghost Adventures and he's picking up EVPs or he's talking to voices over the SB7 uh, or, you know, things are communicating through some of his other uh, pieces of equipment that you see on the show. What is actually, what is actually communicating with him? Well, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, what those ghosts are, are basically those that are now in that state of limbo where they are slowly breaking down and dissipating. And all that's left there, because there's no brain anymore, there's no intellection, you don't have the faculties of, of judgment, and, um, and um, uh, you're not able to, to discern using your mind in that way anymore, because you don't have a mind like that anymore. Now you have just instinct and awareness, that's it. And it's raw, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's just pure instinctual behavior. Um, there is nothing outside of just that condition. And so, essentially, if you die outside of the state of grace and you're not preserved, then you become whatever that, loss, that, that, that last thought was. So if you die in a state of fear, fear is what you become. If you die in a state of rage, rage is what you become. And that kind of leads us into the next question that uh, we have from Twitter. Um, and ho hopefully, I don't know, Joy, if there's anything else that you would like to elaborate on or if that wasn't a complete enough answer, let me know. Um, but uh, that's kind of the best way to explain what purgatory is. Yeah, it, it seems to me kind of like uh, when I'm using all this equipment to talk to somebody who's passed on, th I'm communicating with someone who's just sitting in the waiting room for help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, essentially, that's what it is. And so they're terrified, they're fearful. A lot of them are not there because of grace. Now, that doesn't mean to say that people from purgatory or heaven cannot communicate with us as well. God does permit that. Um, a great example from pop culture on that is the whole story of A Christmas Carol with Charles Dickens. Yeah. Um, that, you know, Jacob Marley was actually, you could argue, Okay, you know, it depends on the different depictions. Sometimes they depict him as being in hell. Sometimes they depict him as being sort of like a limbo type of spirit. But in reality, the only way he would be able to be there, to have enough conscience to want to help his partner uh, uh, Scrooge from suffering the same fate that he did, is that God permits the spirit of Jacob Marley to come to him to help save him. And I would like to believe that that is part of Jacob Marley's purgatory, that to, way to purify him from his misdeeds, the same misdeeds that he... And in, in some depictions, Jacob Marley is actually worse than Scrooge. Um, he was actually a worse person than Scrooge. Scrooge is really basically, if you really break him down psychologically, he's really just a victim of abuse. Uh, he had an abusive dad, um, and, you know, he looked to money and material comforts in order to escape the realities of his emotions, and then he wasn't able to ever really translate that in any way to his, um, in, in, in the way that he, you know, loves his significant other there, who he loses, um, you know, that's what the whole story essentially is all about. Hey, Sister Mary Jones actually in the house. If you're in the chat room, you can talk to Sister Mary Jones. She is fight the dark. Go check her out. And there is a question from the chat room real quick. Uh, people are asking about the, what's the name of the show? And, and Tracy uh, did uh, mention that there's no official name, and that's correct. The official name, though, the official title of my reality show treatment is called The Exorcists, plural. OK, they probably will not keep that name. Producers and networks love to change things. Uh, but uh, if you're if they will know it, the networks will know it. Those that have seen it will know it by the name, the exorcists. So if you need want to go and tell them to, to pick up the show that you want to see that show, uh, that's the name of the treatment. Um, but anyway, 
Uh, yeah, so that whole Jacob Marley thing uh, and Scrooge thing is an example of how God would permit a person from purgatory or even limbo to come and appear for the purposes of another salvation. And even the saints and angels will appear in types of apparitions and visions to communicate loved ones the same way. It works exactly the same way. Um, so now, that's that's kind of I hope explains the que- or answers the yeah. question. Now, now I do have one more question. Um, how does purgatory and limbo fit in with the idea of reincarnation? Well, see, reincarnation is an interesting concept because again, because of the Western world and the way that people have um, taken Eastern knowledge and converted it into their own biases uh, you know the new age movement has been horrible for this theosophy um or the theosophical society hasn't really helped uh, madame blavatsky these people took you know eastern knowledge and kind of wrote about it in western terms and then the new age movement just jumped all over it and uh, misunderstood everything that was being said but reincarnation is not is not this idea of perpetuation of the being or the self. Because remember, in Buddhism, which is the strongest <coughs> proponent for reincarnation as, as far as how we understand it to be. I mean, Buddhists are, you know, Buddhism is one of, its, one of its tenets, one of its fundamental aspects is reincarnation. Um, Buddhism does not, does not believe in the self. They have a doctrine that refers to this as anatta, which means no soul. And so there is nothing there. There's no essential identity to reincarnate. So what reincarnates? It's what we would call the alaya, the spiritual essence. And the best uh, Western equivalent to that is the soul. And that is basically the life force. It's not an identity. You don't own it. It doesn't belong to you. It actually has really very little to do with you outside of the fact that it animates your identity so what you think is you is really basically your body and your spirit being animated by this external force that is known as a soul but it doesn't belong to you uh, you belong to it and you're just a product of its you're created out you're, you're created for its purposes not the other way around and so it's a bit of a reversal so what reincarnation is that is the reanimation of those properties Okay, that we call in Buddhism aggregates, in esoteric mysticism, which is my field of study, a field of study that I more or less developed um, uh, beyond what it essentially started out as, uh, I call them aggregations. And these are those eternal properties that are, we are made up of, which are basically broken down into the various archetypes of human psychology. Those eternal properties are animated by this thing we call the soul in the West, the Alaya in the East, and that uh, uh, comes together to form the appearance of an identity. But when a person it reincarnates, what it essentially is, is it's not the person, it's not the self, it's not the identity that reincarnates, it's just basically all of the energy. So what hell essentially is, if you really want to break it down, is a recycling plant. It absorbs the energy, it breaks it down, and then it converts that energy into a new form once again, and that energy is what we would call reincarnation and of course there are certain things that are stored within that energy certain memories certain things certain skills and so therefore a person that has inherited aggregates from a very sophisticated individual that was broken down by this process of limbo and hell uh, uh, is able to you know capitalize on some of those skills because they will still be present in the spiritual memory of the energy itself but it's not the same person it's a new person, it's a new identity, and that also will break down over time, um, unless the person attains to salvation, which is a completely different thing. So in the, e- in the West, we would refer to that as going to heaven. In the East, that would be, uh, that would be a, a, a breaking free of the wheel of samsara. They no longer reincarnate. They enter into a state of parinirvana, which is eternal bliss, not terribly different from the Christian heaven just a different semantics and a slightly different philosophical way of looking at it. So, does that answer the question? I think so. And I, I think it really ties into the next question that came in, um, which was, have you ever come across a spirit that was not a good person in life that tries to harm or kill a living person in death? 
Yes, we do. We actually come across that quite frequently, and here's an opportunity for us to perhaps break down and explore the four types of demons that we've talked about on this show before, but as those of you who listen to the archives know that that show had a lot of technical problems, and I was never really satisfied with how it came out. So we're going to, let's discuss this again, um, and we've got, you know, a good 20 minutes to do so, so let's see what we, let's see how far we can get, and then if we have time at the end of the show, maybe we can take a few more questions from the uh, chat room. Um, but uh, looking at the four types of demons, now these are my own designations, these are things that I've broken down in my experience of working in this field for more than 20 years. Um, and yes, I was doing paranormal investigation before paranormal investigation was cool. Um, I've been involved in this field from the very beginning of my ministerial life. It wasn't why I got into it. I kind of just was thrown into it, and that's just where I ended up. So understand, when I am teaching here, when I'm answering these questions, whether it be on Twitter or on this show, I'm not answering your questions with my own opinions. I have my own opinions about things, but I don't put much value into them any more than I put value into anybody's opinions. Everyone's got an opinion, and what, who cares? All that matters is what's actual. And so when I'm teaching you really is from my own personal experience, observations that I have made that I have verified to be true, as well as taking from what ancient knowledge has given us, whether it be the apostolic tradition or even the esoteric mystery schools that are even older. Okay, That's where this information is coming from. I've put it all together and I've utilized it and I've explored it and I've done everything I can do with it in order to make sense of it. And now I'm giving that information to you. So when you hear me speak authoritatively about these things, I'm not trying to say, oh, you know, I don't want to hear, oh, Bishop, I don't agree with you. I don't think you're right about that. It doesn't matter. Okay. We're getting those, uh, the, the, the keyboard again, Joy. Oh. <laughs> goodness <laughs> no problem i i thought uh, i hit the mute no it's it's it didn't mute oh, try wow. it again okay is can you hear me yeah i can well the mute doesn't work <laughs> apparently not it's blinking what does the mute do how about the mute on your skype connection does that help does that one Where... work? there should be a mute on skype Let's see if i can pull up the right thing sorry guys we have to work out these bugs we're <laughs> Goodness. We got a new uh, I can that place the, I can place it on hold. Is this? There should be a mute option on, on Skype. There should be like a little microphone at, at the bottom there. And okay. You click mute. Okay, let me try. Yeah, that, that did that work? That works. Okay. That works. So there's your Good mute button. <laughs> No problem, no problem. Okay, so going okay. forward, I just want to make clear that that's where this information is coming from. So if you hear me talk authoritatively, it's not my opinion. It's just because I am very experienced in this work, and I've done a lot of study, more so than most people have, on the answers to these very deep, lifelong questions. Okay, so understand that going forward. So now, out of that wealth of experience... What I have been able to tell you, what I've been able to derive is that there's four primary states of what Christians would refer to as the demonic. And only one of them is truly demonic. So let's discuss those, and that will answer this, uh, this individual's question from Skype about uh, you know, spirits of the dead that mean harm towards other people. So the first state of a demon, the first type of demon that we would encounter in, in the basic demonology that I reference, the model that I use in my work, are fallen angels. Now, you know what these are. These are the Judeo-Christian angels, all right? These are pre-existent beings that uh, are far more sophisticated than human beings. And we know about them from the Bible. We know about them from apostolic tradition. We know about them from apocryphal sources and extra-canonical sources. And, um, you know, even the New Age has gotten jumped on the angel bandwagon. So there's a lot, lot there to work with, Okay. But there is, of course, the fallen angels, and there's a metaphor and a theology that's based upon this, and people have read Enoch, and, you know, they know about, you know, even Jesus sort of references what, seeing Satan fall, um, you know, and, and what the fallen angels are, those that have become disobedient to God and have utilized their power to influence the world under their own will instead of God's will, have violated their creative purpose, not unlike Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
And so um, those particular beings are what we would refer to as fallen angels, and they are now what we would refer to as demons and these are true demons okay these are what this is what satan is satan being uh, lucifer lucifer the light bearer the angel that was more beautiful than any other angel um, and was sort of like god's right hand man and he turns on god and then the result uh, at least as far as the metaphorical theology goes becomes uh, satan the adversary or the devil in common vernacular. And uh, so any angel that sided with him uh, also would be a fallen angel, and that makes up the majority of this, uh, I don't want to say pantheon, but I guess you could say hierarchy, of, uh, of qu- or choirs. I guess the proper theological term would be choirs of angels. These are the choirs of fallen angels, and there's different states of demons that fall into this category. Okay, they're all angels, though. They have just no. They have fallen from grace. They still have all of the faculties of their creation, just like we do. We're fallen human beings. We still have the power to create, but we also have the power to wreak havoc with that power. And so, you know, just like human sexuality, we can take human sexuality and it could be a wonderful thing to display the love between a man and a woman to create a baby, but we can also use it to rape people. We can use it to molest children. We can do all sorts of horrible things with human sexuality. It wasn't created to be a horrible thing. It's a beautiful thing. Ask any Jewish rabbi. He'll tell you how great human sexuality is. But um, in, unfortunately, it can be used in, in, for evil. And the same thing goes for angels. They can use their, their particular uh, power that God has given them as an angelic being for evil purposes. And this is what the fallen angels are. So that's the first state. Okay. Now, the second state of what we would call demon are not a true demon. They're not fallen angels. What they are are what we would refer to as elementals or primordials. Okay, you could use either term um, because essentially what I mean here by primordial is that they were part of the pre-existent creation. Okay, they've been around from the very, very beginning. Human beings, not so much. We weren't here from the beginning. We, we, creation's been here a lot longer than us by billions and billions and billions of years if you're looking at it from a linear perspective. And, um, and so there are creatures that exist that are almost entirely non-corporeal or entirely non-corporeal. They have no physical structure, but they are living things within the universe. And they are creatures just like uh, human beings and angels. They were created by God, and uh, they exist uh, to do to survive, just like everything else that in creation exists to survive, just like human beings exist to survive. Um, but there's different levels, just like there are different levels of demons and angels, there's different levels of uh, elementals. Some are extremely sophisticated and far more intelligent than a human being. An example of that would be the jinn from uh, Arabian lore that's now built into Islam as part of their I guess the closest equivalent to demons that they would uh, uh, experience, and then um, some are as 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 uh, unsophisticated, and most of them actually are uh, as a mosquito. So basically, they're like a spiritual mosquito that goes around uh, feeding off of your energy, making you sick, just like a. Sp- a physical mosquito can carry a disease like a virus or malaria, something like that. Uh, these uh, elementals can also do the same thing and um, and uh, make you sick spiritually. And so they latch onto you to feed off of you. Uh, and that's their instinct. They're not trying to be malicious. They're not trying to harm you. That's just their instinct to survive. And you are an energy source and uh, they're taking your energy, and that's uh, what happens. So sometimes when you come in contact with these elementals, they can make you sick. People think they have a demonic attachment, and for, you know, from the Christian vantage point, it is, because it's definitely not something that is is healthy. Um, It's not good for your spiritual life, so we have to get rid of it. But there's different ways to get rid of these things, and depending upon the intelligence of the elemental, uh, their ability to communicate, their ability to understand, we're able to uh, change uh, how uh, we can. We're able to heal people based upon the type of problem that they have. So, generally speaking, exorcism is not the best choice for a elemental. There's other ways to deal with them, uh, saving exorcism for the fallen angels, which is typically the only way to get rid of an, uh, a, a truly genuine demonic attack from that first class of demon that we talked about. Now, 
moving into the third class and that is what we would call created okay now this can refer to two different types of things one can be those spirits or or, or demonic forces i guess you could call them but they're really, again, not fallen angels, so they're not true demons, uh, that would fall into this category of ceremonial magic where people perform a ritual. Skilled magicians or magi uh, uh, perform rituals using ceremonial magic to conjure uh, a servitor or some kind of creature that can service its will. And this is a created being uh, that will do the bidding of the, cre- of the person that does the creation. Uh, and uh, when they stop being fed by the the magician or the witch or the occult practitioner, um, then they can turn on that practitioner and become a demonic force feeding off of their energy, not unlike an elemental. Um, and they could be a real force to reckon with. The worst thing about these types of demons is that they can also... Um, be created inadvertently because we, by a virtue of our very selves, being b- created in the image of God, which is not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. We, He is the ultimate creator and we are built in his image, which means we share in that ultimate creative ability that when we suffer a trauma or when we are angry or when we are emotionally provoked in some way, we can subconsciously create a demon of this kind and they can latch onto us and create a demonic attachment and they become a thought form that gets projected out and are just as real as anything else, even as real, if not more so, than you are. And that is a real problem and that's something we see quite often. There are sometimes when I am performing exorcisms, part of the rite of exorcism is to command through the name of Jesus Christ that the demon reveals itself and sometimes the name I get will be things like lust or anger or hatred. They are basically archetypal manifestations of these primal human emotions created by the victim. And that's the third kind of demon, and that's a very common one. But the last and fourth kind of demon are essentially what answers the question here, and that is what we would refer to as a wrathful spirit. Now, a wrathful spirit are basically just the spiritual, non-corporeal aspect of a person who has died. But the reason they become wrathful is because they have too many attachments and thus produce attaching behavior after death. So when I said before with the last question, if you die in a state of rage, you become rage because that's your instinct now. And all you've got is instinct. You don't have your brain anymore, so you can't use judgment. You can't use reason to get yourself out of it. You can only think instinctually like an animal. No other way out. And you lash out with your primal instinct. If it's anger, then anger is what you are. If it's rage, rage is what you are. If it's jealousy, jealousy is what you are. And that's it. That's the bottom line. And so um, people that have died unexpectedly, uh, unprepared, uh, they did not die well. They're not spiritually prepared to die. They are uh, angry at being maybe murdered or in an accident because of a, a drunk driver. Now they're angry at the at the person for hitting them. Um, the list goes on and on and on, but murder is a big one. Um, what ends up happening is they become that state of rage. And then they become, for all intents and purposes, a demonic force to anyone who encounters them, including their own family members. And that is uh, essentially how uh, this fourth class of demon, which also is not a true demon, um, can latch on and create an attachment to a person uh, in a negative way. And then even that class has its own way of being resolved. They need to be prayed for and they need to be released. And they're usually terrified of being released because think about, again, what we talked about with limbo and hell. I mean, essentially, if they're a wrathful spirit, they are not saved, uh, at least not in any um, uh, uh, distinguishable way. And so limbo is where their condition is, which is a terrifying condition to be in. And uh, they're facing the abyss, the annihilation, and they don't want to be released from that. So it's easier to latch on to a human being or a place or an object and try to continue the illusion of life for as long as they can maintain it. 
and then eventually, unfortunately, that makes the place haunted and uh, the, the living inhabitants sick. So Joe asks, if they're instinctive, can they still communicate intelligently? In the initial stages, yes, they can, uh, but it's only a mirror. It's, an, it's, it's not a true intellectual conversation. Okay, so they basically will respond almost as a shadow of what they would have responded to like they were alive. I try to explain there's no real living world analogy that can make this make sense. The best way that I can explain it is pretend that you have a home video of your grandfather who has long died and imagine if you could pop in that cassette tape or that DVD and watch that home video and imagine if you could ask your grandfather questions and he'd be able to respond with simple one sentence or one word answers and all the answers you could get from him are what would be the expected answer that he could give he couldn't give you anything new beyond what he already would have answered when he was alive and that's essentially uh, how it creates the appearance through EVP and various other forms. Even mediums who can communicate with the dead are communicating with them at that level. Um, it has all of the appearances of intellectual conversation, but really all it is is it's a record being played over and over again at key points to make it have a conversation. I know it's hard to explain. It's hard to understand. A lot of people don't agree with it because they don't understand what I'm trying to say with it. But you're just going to have to take my word for it because that's how it works. Nutmeg says, I'm going to go off on a limb here and say that perhaps that's where vanity began with Lucifer since he was described as the most beautiful angel. I wonder if that is any part of why he turned on God. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a, a metaphor for an ineffable reality of the divine that is beyond our comprehension. So we have a story, a theology to talk about the the reality without, um, you know, in a way that the human mind can understand. Um, Nutmeg also asks, if a person attains salvation, they will not reincarnate? Um, correct. Salvation is permanence, which means that your body, your spirit, and the animating force of your soul become permanently unified. This is why the church theology likens salvation to the resurrection of the dead. You see, because the body reanimates, it comes back. It's a physical thing. If you, if you understand the Christian theology, that's not a metaphor. Jesus Christ physically resurrected. He didn't just spiritually resurrect. He didn't just like show up as a ghost. Now, the resurrected body has ghost-like abilities, but it's still the resurrected body. It was still the body he had in life. This is proven by the, the whole story of Doubting Thomas. And we just actually celebrated the Feast of St. Thomas recently. And that's what it's all about. Because Thomas doesn't believe he's back. And the only way he's going to believe is if he can put his finger, fingers through the nail marks. And the resurrected body of Jesus has those nail marks. Why? Because it is his body. It's just resurrected. It's been reanimated. And our bodies, too, will become like that. So the kingdom of heaven that we await as Christians is not just a spiritual reality, but a physical one, too. We return to these bodies, but they will be made perfect as Adam and Eve's were in the beginning. Immortal and not, no longer subject to suffering and death. So Joe says, seems like in a way paranormal investigations are a waste of time. Not necessarily. It depends on what you're trying to do with them. Okay, if you're trying to prove that there is spiritual energy out there, then there are wonderful ways of proving that. If you're trying to identify a spirit who's causing a particular victim a problem, like a demonic attachment or an infestation or any kind of oppression, possession, whatever, then paranormal investigation is essentially the only way to do that. So it has its applications, but there's limitations to it as well. If you're just trying to have a conversation with the dead, um, well, there's better ways to do that. And typically spirits in limbo are not really going to be uh, great sources of information because they don't really have the faculties of intellection capable of giving you anything that's quite useful, which is why you know, paranormal investigation has never really rendered anything that is that is exceptional in terms of, you know, definitive proof of life after death or whatever that you want to refer to it as. The better proof is the apparitions, okay, of the saints. And the church, you know, has the, the 
communion of saints. Uh, they have canonized saints where there have to be proven incidences where this particular individual has has shown itself or himself or herself to be alive in the kingdom of heaven and through miracles and interactions and apparitions and things of that nature. Those are far better examples, but they tend to be very personal and they don't have any agenda to push. They're not trying to prove to the world that they exist. They don't care if you believe in them or not. Um, but for those of people of faith, when there's a purpose and God has a way of utilizing this interaction for the benefit of people's salvation, he will reveal it. But it's usually at a personal level, which doesn't really satisfy the overall dynamic of people wanting more than that. Well, my goodness, what, 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 a, what, a, what a fast <laughs> hour, Joy. What a fast hour. It really has flown by. <laughs> it really has. Um, I don't think there's really much time for anything else, so I'm just going to uh, say that that's going to have to be it for this week. Uh, yeah. But uh, Joy and I will be back next week uh, on Friday the 13th. Uh, a great day for a show about uh, on this kind of uh, subject matter. Of we'll take more questions from Twitter and more from the chat room, and then maybe we'll have time to have people call in. We'll maybe be able to do a two-hour episode next week. We're also going to have um, uh, a guest next week, uh, Shannon Nieswenter, who is uh, my uh, one of my lead investigators in my uh, outreach ministry. She's also the director of outreach for the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church, and she'll be joining us next week for about an hour or so to talk about her experiences with this work and uh, you can even ask her uh, questions yourself and see what it's like as a lay person working in, a, in an exorcist ministry like this. But uh, anyway, God bless you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Joy. Uh, thanks. thanks to all of you in the chat room, Sister Mary Joan, uh, Joe, Julie, Nutmeg, all of you out there uh, for showing up. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. God bless. Until next week, this is Bishop Brian Willette saying we'll see you then. <laughs>